Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I will give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own world views. Today, I would like to introduce you to Shelly Wilson. She speaks to Christian faith-based women's groups to help them become closer to Jesus. It was when she was first diagnosed with renal failure that she turned to more spiritual discipline. So there's more to that than just those few little sentences. So I'm happy to have Shelly here tonight and have her share more about her journey and her story. So thank you, Shelly. Why don't you go ahead and tell the audience a little bit more about yourself? Okay, well, thank you for having me. Uh, I live in southwest Missouri in a little town, about 10,000 people, and I actually live in the country, but uh, I was born and raised in a Christian home, and I accepted Christ as my Savior at an early age, like six years old, at Vacation Bible School. And my whole life, I have tried to live for Jesus. And I followed that um, path, that Christian worldview. Um, But, you know, after you've been a Christian for almost 60 years, you become kind of lax in what I would call the spiritual disciplines. And so... uh, a couple years ago, I was diagnosed with renal failure. Or for those of you that don't know what renal means, it's kidney failure. And you have to have kidneys to live. And I didn't know, you know, exactly what my future held. And it was pretty rough. I could not even hardly wear any clothes. I was so bloated up. And I had to wear either slippers or snow boots on my feet because my feet were so swollen. I could not even get out of a chair on my own. I was on oxygen. I had to use a walker to walk. I was in the worst shape ever. And what this whole situation did to me uh, a year ago, it led me to my patio and a kind of a come to Jesus meeting. And I prayed out there and I said, Lord, I don't know what you have for me in all of this. And how is this illness going to glorify you? Um, I've always been passionate about Jesus, but not as passionate as I am now. I feel like this really was a call to action, kind of a wake-up call for me to say, hey, I'm not done with you yet. There's a lot more that I want you to do. And so I've been teaching the Bible for 40 years through my church and through various um, home groups and different women's retreats and all. But I just started this whole speaking gig because of my illness, because God wants me to tell people the time is now. And I don't want to be a preacher of hellfire and brimstone. I want to be somebody who encourages women and says, here's what you can do to grow in your faith. And so I'm looking at four spiritual disciplines, Bible study, prayer, memorization, and rest. And so for me, Bible study, you know, usually about December 15th at my church, everybody starts pulling out their reading plans. They're going to read through the Bible in a year. And so here's this plan. It includes Psalms and Proverbs. This one is chronological. This one goes Genesis to Revelation. And so we all are so excited. We've picked our plan. And January 1st, boom, we hit the reading trail. And typically, when you are reading through the Bible in a year, there's a lot of reading on some days because you've got to get through that Old Testament. 
And there's some things that even though they're important, they're so dry and it's so hard to do. And so on Sunday mornings, we come back together and everybody talks about what they've read, what chapter they're on, what they've learned. And then come around February 15th, the conversations start dwindling off. And come about March 1st, I realize I am way behind. And now I feel like a complete failure. And so I just stop because Bible study should not be a competition. It's not who can read the most and the fastest. Um, When I read the Bible, when I study the Bible, I want to get something out of it. It's not like a speed reading course. And so uh, God in Scripture asks us to be close to him. And how do we be close to him? It's through Bible study. That's his big revelation to us. It's through Bible study and prayer. And so I have a very easy way of studying the Bible. And it's, it's so easy, it, it almost seems ridiculous. But I ask two questions. What does this passage say about God? And what does it say about me or for me? And so let's take uh, Psalm 23, for instance. The first verse is, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Okay, what does that say about God? He's my shepherd. Well, what does a shepherd mean? And so you can look up other scriptures in the Bible and see what a shepherd is. And like in Luke, it says the shepherd was the one who left his 99 sheep and went out to find the one that was lost. And there's a famous picture of Jesus holding that lost lamb and all the other sheep kind of crowded around behind him. That's the picture of Jesus finding the lost lamb. And if I belong to the shepherd, he is going to come and find me. And when I am in my deepest trouble, he's going to carry me. Isn't that beautiful? And so then what does that say about me? It says, I shall not want. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to get the diamond necklace and the sports car and and everything like that. That means our needs are going to be provided for. And sometimes that means surviving on toast. You know, we don't all get the big brunch. Some people do get the big brunch, but most people live on toast. And I'm not speaking about food. I'm speaking about just life in general. And, um, The Lord is going to take care of our needs, whatever they are. And if we look at uh, psychology and Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, food, shelter, and clothing are at the top. A sense of belonging is kind of next. And I don't remember all the other ones, but those key ones at the bottom of that pyramid are going to be met by Jesus. and. It's where we have to totally put our trust in him and be totally dependent on him and surrender everything to him. And that's really hard. But if we look at that, the rest of that passage, it talks about he leads us beside still waters. He restores our soul. Now, I'm not going to get this all right. I have memorized it, but (laughs) sometimes I get the phrases in the wrong order. Um, he sets a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And who's our enemy? Our enemy is Satan. As believers, that's our ultimate enemy. And so he, he sets a table before us in the presence of our enemies. He's like, you know, get behind me, Satan. This is my time that I'm going to feed my sheep. And I'm talking spiritual food. And where do we get that spiritual food but from the Bible? And so this is my basic format of studying the Bible. What does it say about God? What does it say about me or for me? And we can take every passage that you can think of and apply that. Now, sometimes like in the genealogies in the Old Testament, there's not going to be a whole lot there because it's just reading 
who was the father of who and who was the father of who and who was the father of who. But from those genealogies, we find out that Jesus comes from the line of David, the king. And Jesus is ultimately the king of kings. And so anyway, I encourage people to read the Bible um, because we want to become closer to Jesus. As believers, that's our goal. And if you've gone through kind of a dry spell like I did, you know, Maybe hearing my voice is your call to action. Maybe you've had a crisis in your life. Maybe it was cancer. Maybe you lost a job. Maybe it was divorce. Maybe it was something else, a death in your family or whatever it could be. It might be your call to action for the Lord to say, come to me and I will give you rest. So then my next uh, discipline that I want to talk about is prayer and prayer. A lot of times people think prayer is asking for God. We pray for health, wealth, and safety a lot. And we pray for that new car. We pray for that new job. We pray for our sick grandma. I mean, and that none of those things are necessarily wrong, but if you have your best friend and you're talking to them, Are you saying to them, could you help me get a new car? Could you go over to the hospital and heal my grandma? You know, no, they can't. And that's not how we have a conversation with our friends. So Jesus is our friend, even though he's Lord God Almighty. He still is our friend. He wants to hear from us. He wants us to be real. He wants us to share things of our day. and. You know, people are like, well, God knows everything. Yes, he does, but he still desires us to tell him. And it's kind of like if you had a spouse and you did something because you always do something this this way and you go home and you tell your husband, well, I stopped at the store. Well, I know you did because you always do, you know, but you still told your husband, you know, even though he already knew it, you still told him. So even though Jesus already knows everything, we still tell him, Lord, you know, I had a good day at work. I met all my deadlines. Thank you for walking with me. Lord, I'm having a problem with my daughter. She's just not listening. She wants to be rebellious. And just to share all these nitty gritties with the Lord, that's what he wants. And as sheep, to the shepherd, if we listen to his voice, we will recognize his voice. Sheep in real life, the four, the four legged version, they come to know their shepherd's voice. And when the shepherd talks, they come running. If somebody else stood at the gate and said, come here, sheep, they wouldn't move because they don't know that person's voice. But as soon as the shepherd talks, they come running. Well, Jesus is our shepherd. And as his sheep, we can hear his voice. Now, it's not probably going to be audible, although it could be. (laughs) But most of the time, it's kind of in your spirit. You feel Jesus talking to you. You feel a confirmation of something. You know, I'm so glad you were able to finish your projects at work. I'm very proud of you. I'm happy for you. Uh, Yes, I, I hope to heal you of this disease, or yes, I'm going to heal your grandmother or, or whatever it might be. We can hear in our spirit, the answers to our prayers. Now they don't always come when we want them, because if you look at the Israelites, they wandered in the desert for 40 years. Can you imagine 40 years of waiting on the Lord? And it was for a purpose because they were not listening to him. They were not being the good sheep that they needed to be. So anyway, prayer is just so personal. And I look at uh, the Lord's Prayer, which is a famous, uh, well-known prayer, no matter what uh, religion you have, what denomination you belong to, you most likely know the Lord's Prayer. And um, (laughs) I just forgot it. (laughs) 
I have so many verses floating around in my head, but um, it starts out with putting God in his rightful place. Father God, hallowed be your name, you know, revered, honorable. It's not coming to God like in a flip way and saying, hey, dude, you know, how are you doing? You know, it, it's putting God in his place where he belongs on the throne, honored, revered, and sovereign over all. And right before the Lord's Prayer, it talks about um, don't pray like the hypocrites who stand out in the streets and pray out loud, trying to gain glory for themselves and not glory for the Lord. Or don't pray in repetitions over and over, like a mantra or a chant. Uh, We don't need to do that. The Lord knows what's on our heart and mind, so we could just say it one time. And we don't have to, you know, get into kind of a rhythm and and, uh, pray that way. Um, But the prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So here we're praying in the Lord's will, not our will. And that's hard to do sometimes because we sure want our way, don't we? We we all do. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. So here again, it's talking about our provisions. It's our daily bread. It's our daily spiritual bread. Um, It's what we need, not what we want. And then it says, um, lead us not into temptation. Or no, it says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So Jesus didn't need forgiveness. He was sinless. But he's modeling a prayer for us. And we do need to ask for forgiveness. Because by nature, we're sinners. And so... We need to be confessing and repenting of our sins on a as-needed basis. Um, We need to forgive others just as Jesus has forgiven us. And sometimes that's hard because, boy, do we want revenge. And then it says, uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so... Pray for protection, that we know how to discern evil from good. The world is very deceiving today. And there's a lot of things that are like half-truths, and then the rest of it's not true. And it's very enticing because you're like, well, I've heard that before. And then you fall into the trap of believing the part that's not true. And so we are to pray for deliverance from temptation and from evil. And how perfect is that? Deliver us from temptation and and evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And so then again, praise the Lord for who he is, Lord God Almighty. So that was just a model prayer that Jesus gave to us. And so that would be the things that I would include in my prayer. I would praise the Lord. I would pray for um, his will, not my will. I would pray for my daily provisions. And I would pray that I could forgive and be forgiven. And then I would pray, again, praising God, glorifying his name, because his kingdom is coming. And so that's just a little snippet on the prayer part of spiritual disciplines. And I mean, it's not that hard. There's no time um, commitment per se. I'm saying if you just start out with 15 minutes a day, as you do it and as you pray for the Lord to give you the desires to be with him more, that time might grow. And I actually do it early in the morning before the rest of my household gets up because then I know I'm not going to be interrupted. Because if I wait until one person gets up, it's hard 
because then they want to come in and have coffee with you and sit with you. And, you know, then there's no time. You've, you've lost your window. And so pick a time that is good. Some people I know go to their car on lunch and do it at lunchtime in the in their car where nobody's going to bother them. They turn the phone off and that's where they do it. Um, the Bible does tell us in that same passage of the Lord's Prayer to go into our quiet place, our our prayer closet, if you will, and just be alone with Jesus. And I know this all sounds maybe a little hokey pokey because Jesus is this entity, this being that we have a relationship with, yet we don't see him. And so I know it's hard for some people to grasp, but like I said, when you are his sheep and you are really tuned into him, you are going to hear him speak to you from the Bible. And even in the quietness of your prayer time, he's going to speak to your heart. And, um, you know, as we read uh, Psalm 23 again, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Um, In that passage, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. God is with us every day. And if we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, which I feel like I did because of my disease, I actually, at that prayer time that I had on my patio, I was willing to die. I thought I was going to die. I wrote my obituary. And I mean, talk about a come to Jesus moment. (laughs) When you're writing your obituary, you're serious. You know, I was willing, but I wasn't really 100% ready. You know, I I am ready to die as far as spiritually. I, I know I'm going to heaven, but I wasn't really ready because I felt like there was more for me to do here on this earth. There's people that I know and love that have not accepted Jesus as their Savior. I want more time to talk to them and witness to them and read the scriptures to them so that maybe they could be persuaded. Um, So then the next of my spiritual disciplines is memorization. And now people are like, oh, good grief. You know, here we go again. Uh, How am I going to memorize? I'm too old to memorize. There's lots of... um, resistance to memorizing. But I'm going to tell you, memorizing has saved me so many times when I am in a situation and I wonder what on earth, you know, and then that scripture will come to mind. And here's a very good example. I lived in Alaska for a number of years. And the first year that I lived there, I worked at a boarding school for Native Americans. 250 kids started out that school year. They lived in <clears throat> an old barracks building left over from the war, war. And I was the night dorm monitor. So my job was to walk the halls every night and check in every room with a flashlight and make sure all the kids were in bed sleeping. Well, Those kids come from such a varied background of religious beliefs. And being Native Americans, it's more what I would call spiritist and animistic. And some of the kids even had pentagrams drawn on the floors of their rooms. And so I started getting scared, and I felt like Satan was actually at that school. And it made me nervous and sick to go to work at 10 o'clock at night. You know, you're in the darkness and here you feel like this school is possessed by the devil. And I was just so upset about it. I thought, what on earth am I going to do? And so I talked to my pastor and I said, what can I do? He's like, well, the devil is not like God. The devil is not everywhere all at once. The devil can only be one place at a time. 
whereas God can be everywhere at a time. And that just gave me such comfort because I thought, oh, okay, it's not going to be the devil himself. It's going to be a demon, and I can handle that. Anyway, I walked those halls at night quoting scriptures out loud that I had memorized in years gone by. And um, Joshua 1, nine, have I not commanded you? Do not be uh, afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God goes with you wherever you are. Wherever I am, the Lord is there. Um, Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. I'm saved by Jesus. I don't have to worry about the devil. And so it was very comforting at that time in my life that I had all these scriptures that I could call up. And it's comforting even now in my life when I'm not in that kind of a situation But sometimes I get, you know, maybe there's a traffic problem or, you know, who knows what. You have an argument with your coworker or something. You can just call up a verse. um, Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32. So my recipe for memorizing is to pick verses that are meaningful to you. Don't pick something that doesn't have a message for you because you're not going to remember it, but pick something that really is speaking to your life at this time. And that will have something for you to really cling to. And in a time of need, you can call it up. And so pick something that is relevant to where you're at today. And don't pick like a big whole chapter. Just pick one verse. You know, start small. Because if we pick a whole verse, or I mean a whole chapter, we're going to get discouraged right out of the bat, you know, right off the bat. Let's just pick something small. Like, um... Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. How hard is that? You know, everybody could have that memorized. Um, Or pick some that maybe are related to your salvation, like John 3, 16 is a very popular verse for people to have memorized. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Beautiful. Now, it's a little longer, but it might relate to your situation. So pick something short and pick something that relates to you. And <clears throat> then what you do is you kind of meditate on it and you kind of start saying the phrases to yourself over and over. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And maybe you ask yourself, what does that mean? And you find more meaning in it. And then you say it again. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want. What does that mean? You know, how does that apply to my life right now? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Psalm 23, 1. Beautiful. Um, Another way that I memorize scripture is by songs. And uh, a lot of churches today sing what I call scripture songs. They're words straight out of the Bible put to music. And so that Ephesians 4.32 that I just recited to you a few minutes ago, I have a little song for that. Be ye kind one unto another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ has, Christ's sake has forgiven you, do, do. Doodly do Ephesians 4.32. Now that's kind of silly, but it helps you remember it. And that when I ever hear or feel like I need Ephesians 4.32, that song goes through my head. And I have a lot of songs from scripture. And so that is a very easy and effective way to memorize. And you can find scripture songs and put it on your podcast or your 
your Spotify or your Amazon Music or whatever you use to listen to, Apple, and listen to it over and over and over. And it's going to become part of you. And then um, sometimes it's better to have an accountability partner. And for a season, I had an accountability partner. We picked out verses and we memorized them one a week. We would call each other in the morning on our way to work and we would say the phrases to the verse until we could say the whole verse. And just knowing that I had that friend there that was going to kind of grade me, you know, made me want to get it memorized. And same for her. And so that worked very well. And my pastor at the time, he said, well, I'm constantly working on a list of 100 verses to memorize. And I thought, wow, I wonder if I could do that. So I went home and I wrote down the the references to all the verses that I had memorized that I could remember. And it came close to 100. So I added a couple more. And then I just kept reviewing that list and reviewing that list and reviewing that list to make sure that they were solid in my mind. I still have to review that list. But I go back to my favorites, you know, depending on what the circumstance is. So, I mean, some very simple ways of adding spiritual disciplines into your life. You know, read the Bible for 15 minutes. What does it say about God? What does it say about you? Pray to Jesus. Be open. Be honest. Just talk to him like a friend. He is your friend. Keep him in the right place as the Lord God Almighty, but just talk to him like a friend. And then memorize scripture because that is a way that God can keep you from being led into temptation, a way that God can keep you from making the wrong choice, a way that God can encourage you when you're in a discouraging situation all these things. And then the final one that I talk about in my speaking engagements is rest. And people might think, well, what does that mean? And so rest and peace are kind of synonymous in this situation. Um, We look at Psalm 23 and it says, that he leads us beside the still waters and restores our soul. Jesus can give us a time of rest, but we have to pull away for a little minute. You know, think of yourself in the fast lane and cars are going 90 miles an hour and you're just trying to keep up to keep from getting run over. And it's time for us to kind of pull off the freeway take a pit stop, kick the tires, change the oil, check out what's going on. And this is, you know, a metaphor for our spiritual life. Kick our spiritual tires, change our spiritual oil, refuel. And we do that by the other spiritual disciplines. They all fold into this one of rest. When we are reading the scripture, when we are in prayer, we are in rest and we have kind of canceled out the world around us and we're just focusing on Jesus. And that is a time of rest. And Jesus says, come, come unto me, all you who are weary and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. It's hard to say weary and rest together. Um, We need to pull away from this world because this world makes us weary. I mean, look at everything that is going on. Talk about a big ball of turmoil. So many issues, so many things. And if we just can pull away from that fast lane of life and just be alone with Jesus, um, I think that's where we find rest. Now, there is something called Sabbath rest, which the Christian denominations talk about how Jesus created the world and on the seventh day he rested. And so they're saying on the Sabbath day, you should rest. 
and the Jewish um, beliefs on the Sabbath day, they do rest. They cannot do any work of any kind. Um, as Americans, it's hard to do that because we go to church, maybe out of going through the motions, it's what we do. And then we come home and gulp down a sandwich and then we want to hit the golf course or we want to go bike riding or we want to go to the lake or whatever it is. It might be fun and recreational, but it's not really resting. And not that we're supposed to take a nap on Sunday afternoon, but that's kind of my favorite thing to do is take a nap. But on Sabbath rest, we need to just step away and just, you know, set aside some time just to be quiet and peaceful and resting and kind of rejuvenate your body and rejuvenate your soul. And um, there's more spiritual disciplines, but I just chose these four because they are kind of what I would call foundations of the faith. If you're not studying the Bible, if you're not praying, and if you're not memorizing, you're definitely probably not resting. Uh, you're, you're probably in turmoil. You're not at peace. If you're doing the first three, most likely you are at peace with Jesus. Your life is, even though it has hectic moments, it's not going to fling apart. Uh, you're able to hold it all together. And so I just want to encourage people to kind of evaluate your lives and see where you are. Number one, if you haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior, now is the time to do it. And it's just so easy to do. Um, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We just pray to the Lord and just say, hey, I've been wrong. I have not been following you. I am repenting and confessing of my sin. And I want you to be the Lord of my life. That's it. And then as your faith grows, you know, plug into a church because the Bible tells us to keep fellowshipping with one another, with believers of like mind. Um, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Do not forsake the getting together for edification of the church for love and spurring one another on towards good deeds and encouragement. That's why we go to church is for that fellowship. It's also to get fed from the scriptures, but a big part of it is that fellowship. Plug into a church where you can be fed the word. Start your own Bible study. Start your own prayer. Start your own memorization. Get a, an accountability a, a partner. If you don't have that available, or if you're not in a church, there's uh, national programs. There's one that is really good called Bible Study Fellowship. And if you plugged into that, you would be discipled and you would learn how to study the Bible. And it's usually, it's men are separate from women. They have groups for both genders. Um, it's usually a small group of, well, it, when you join in and go, it could be a large group of 100 people, but it's split up into small groups of maybe eight or 10 people. And so, you know, it's very easy to talk and to discuss this Bible study and you may find a, a new best friend there, you know. So there's other programs that you can plug into to help you. Um get that accountability partner if you're not already plugged into a church. And if you are plugged into a church, see what your church offers. Maybe they have a women's Bible study. Maybe they have a men's Bible study. Maybe they have a youth Bible study. Uh, maybe you've been going there for a while and you've kind of seen somebody that you'd like to be their friend. Go up and say, hey, I'm looking for a prayer partner. I'm looking for a Bible study partner. Do you want to uh, join up with me? You know, hopefully they would say yes, and off you go. So there's nothing complicated about this plan at all. But the first step is to realize you need it. <laughs> and like I said, I have been a Christian for almost 60 years. 
And here I was very lax in those things in my life, teaching the Bible for 40 years. And I was studying the Bible, but it was not on a day-to-day basis. It was more like a like you do in college, you cram for the test on Saturday night and then the test comes on Sunday morning. You know, that's kind of how I have been doing it. But um, God is good and he is going to lead you down the right path. And that's just my, that's my strategy. And I just hope that a lot of other people can plug into that and, and find that peace and joy with Jesus and grow your faith. And you've clearly shared like how this has changed in your life, you know, where you were, you know, 40 some years ago, how your relationship um, with these disciplines really has grown since, you know, you had this health moment. Um, So I'm curious just to know if you're willing to share where you are health wise, because you are now out and about, not, yes. you know, stuck in the snow boots and all of that. Yes. Yes. So here is, you know, I prayed for healing and I don't know how healing is going to totally look for me, but right now healing is coming through dialysis. So I go to dialysis three times a week for three and a half hours each time, which seems like a lot of time. And I, it is almost like going to a job. I am retired. But it is like going to a job because I have to get up at five in the morning because I start there early. But it's okay because when I get there and they get me set up, then I usually take a nap. (laughs) And they have TVs and you can read and, you know, all those things. So it's not as dull as you might think it would be. Um, I'm just so happy to have the opportunity to be saved by dialysis and that somebody many years ago figured out the system. I mean, who could ever think you could wash your blood? I mean, what a crazy thing is that, you know? And so that is like step one of my healing. And I think my healing is going to come in stages. And so I am set up to go to the Mayo Clinic on uh, August 28th and 29th here next month to be evaluated for a kidney transplant. And I have a living donor. And so if the two of us are a match and everything's a go, I'm hoping to have a new kidney by the end of this year. And that would be like stage two in my healing process. And I'm fully aware that I might not ever have complete healing until I die. And I'm good with that because if that's what God wants, you know, I'm, I'm good with it. But here is the beauty of dialysis. And I think a lot of people see it as kind of a ball and chain and that you can't do anything. I have traveled. I have been to Hawaii for two and a half weeks. And my clinic was able to call a clinic on Maui and set up my treatments there. And I would go there at night after the sun goes down and have my treatment. And I mean, it did not hinder me at all. Um, I'm going to Colorado here in a week or so. I'm going to Minnesota at the end of the month. I'm going to Ohio at the beginning of August. August is a big travel month for me. I'm going to have treatments all over the country in, in Colorado, in Ohio, in Minnesota. And so for those of you that are in kidney failure and you're going to dialysis, don't feel like you're trapped, like it's a ball and chain. It is your ticket to life right now and use it. Come alive. Um, Yes, it's dull and it's boring to have to sit there for that treatment, but it cleans your blood and it allows you to live for a few days until the next treatment, you know? And so uh, treatment has just been such a healing process for me and is so really wonderful. And so I just would hope that kidney patients, you know, everybody with kidney disease, it it's come from different things. It could be from diabetes. 
It could be from many kidney diseases that there are out there. And I don't think people are even aware of what diseases there are with your kidneys until you have to go through this. But don't be discouraged, you know. Memorize some scriptures that are going to encourage you and help you. Uh, You know, the Lord is with you wherever you go, even sitting in that dialysis chair. At my chairs, where at my clinic, they have a vibration system and they also have a heater system. So count it as kind of a little heated massage, you know. I mean, try to find the good in it and talk to your technicians and your nurses. Don't just sit there like a, a lump on a log. You know, be thankful for the life that you have. And um, so... I'm doing really well on my journey. Uh, A year ago, I wouldn't have been able, wouldn't have been able to even talk this long. I would have been totally out of breath. I would have been sucking on my oxygen tank. (laughs) So, I mean, my whole lung capacity is so much better because I don't have a hundred pounds of fluid pressing on me, you know, and It's been quite the journey, but like I said, it was a wake-up call for me, and I just want to tell everybody about it and that see if you're having a wake-up call of your own. Hopefully it's not kidney disease, but it could be something just as tragic, or it could be something way simpler, you know, like your office is closing and you need to find a new job. Now that's still hard for people, but There's a lot of jobs out there, so I know you could do it. So whatever your crisis is, uh, turn it around for good. And there's a Bible verse, and I can't uh, remember the exact uh, reference, but it says, what man meant for evil, God has turned around for good. And so what Satan has meant for evil, God can turn around for good. And so just trust the Lord and know that in the end if your he- if your complete healing comes through death i mean what a blessing is that because then you're going to be with jesus so there's there's nothing to lose um death is hard uh because not everybody has that strong faith to know that their loved one has gone to heaven and so uh You know, when my dad died a few years ago and I was sad that he was gone, but it wasn't that hard for me because I knew that he was in heaven and what better place to be. And he was no longer in pain and anguish. And it was a blessing. And the same with me. If I die of kidney failure, it's a blessing because I'm going to heaven and I'm going to be with Jesus face to face. And... That's my testimony. (laughs) And, you know, this dialysis really, you know, has brought you alive, given you, you know, the second life. And you were just saying, you know, how death can be very hard for people. What was it like writing your obituary and having, you know, people around you, like, were they aware of that? And then obviously, you know, you're still here. That obituary wasn't printed in the paper. No, I've told people about it. I I haven't really shared it with anybody, not really even my husband. But um, I cried through the whole thing because it's like, what do I want people to know about me? And the first thing I would want people to know about me is that I was a strong believer in Christ and that they wouldn't have to be sorrowful for me because I was going to the better place. Like we always say, we we have to kind of couch it in those kind of words, but I'm going to heaven. So there's, there's no, nothing lost there. Um, but I wanted to mention people in my life. I have no kids, but I do have a grandson and uh, two great granddaughters that we've kind of adopted under our wing. Um, But I would want to mention special people in my life that had an influence on me. And so I've gone through in my head, 
you know, the different family members, I wrote their names down on a piece of paper and what they each meant to me. And a lot of it was my cousins, my parents, my grandparents before them. Um, I come from a very strong Christian heritage. My great grandparents, probably my great, great grandparents had this strong Christian belief. And so, I mean, I was blessed even to just be born into that kind of a family because I could have been born into a family of another whole belief that would be, because of what I know now, it would be crushing to me. Of course, if I was born into that family and raised in their, that belief, I would not know the difference. But nevertheless, Jesus is still Lord. And I, I don't want to diss any other religion. Um, but Jesus is the one and only way to heaven. And that it says it in the Bible. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And it sounds like kind of a harsh religion. But that's where I say it's not really a religion. It's a relationship with Jesus. And that's the level that you have to get to. And so writing your obituary is very eye-opening because you're like, well, what have I done in my life? You know, usually obituaries have this whole long list of things that you've accomplished and how good you were and this or that, you know. I didn't really want to have any of that. I wanted to point to people that were instrumental in my life in helping me stay on the Christian path and guiding me and leading me and encouraging me and being an example to me, you know, and, um, my obituary is going to look different than most. (laughs) Right. Well, I appreciate you sharing that along, of course, with, you know, the information about your health journey, all of the, the disciplines that you share and help with for others, you know, to, to support their Christian faith. And at the end of all my episodes, I do ask my guests a random question that doesn't have to do with what we've been talking about. So my question for you today is, what is your go-to meal to make? My go-to meal. You know, I only like to cook if I have a lot of time to do it. And it seems like I'm always in a rush. And so I don't probably always cook the best. You know, I want to say my go-to meal is maybe um, McDonald's chicken nuggets or something. (laughs) But if I was going to make a meal, you know, uh, the other night we had pork chops and gravy with potatoes and green beans. I mean, like a comfort food is my go-to meal whatever that looks like. It could be meatloaf. It could be baked chicken. It could be a salad with tuna on it. I mean, I really love all kinds of food and um, I do like to cook, but like I said, I, I like to have time to do it and not have to rush around. You know, Rachel Ray makes it look so easy because all of her ingredients are already prepped for her and it's just dump it, dump it, dump it, you know, But when we're cooking, we have to chop everything. We've got to measure everything out and get it just so. And um, I like stir fry. I like grilled steak, shrimp scampi, you know, so everything. I, I, I don't really have a favorite meal. But at lunchtime, it would be probably salad with tuna. Um, In the evening, it's going to be a comfort meal, lasagna, pork chops and gravy, something of that nature. All right, that brings this episode to a close. So if you would like to connect with Shelly, I will be leaving her LinkedIn and Facebook accounts in the description. So feel free to reach out to her if you would like to connect. And um, she's working on a website, so that'll be there as well if it is up and running since we've got a couple weeks between when we're recording and when this is actually publishing. And of course, if you'd like to connect with the podcast, our website is in the description as well. It brings you to all of our past episodes and all good 
resources and our social media. We are on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. If you'd like to go follow those pages, that support is always appreciated. And if you would like to share your story and be a guest on the show, feel free to reach out to me via email. That is in the description and always the best way to reach me. And if you would like to support the podcast monetarily, there is a link to do that as well. So thank you so much, Shelly, for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time. Bye. Thank you, Sarah. Goodbye.